on the line top. Yes, what is the ferry of the state? Talking about solar spectrum. Uh, let's go. Yeah. Eric? Do you see my screen now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Uh, first of all, a big thanks to the organizers, both for the meeting in general, but also for making it possible for remote participation. I uh, really like that. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about characterizing granulation in particular um, that via GP modeling, taking advantage of the new sun as a star observation. Yeah. You're muted yeah, 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 yeah. for about a minute. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Am I back? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, outline, you had plenty of time to look at. It looks like it's muting me. Interesting. Um, so you noticed that on Monday, uh, Sam gave you a little bit of a discussion of the NUID Solar Telescope. So just as a, a recap, uh, NUID is a new spectrometer, highly stabilized, has a wide wavelength grasp all the way from the uh, near UV to near IR. Um, and ha we have a little bit over a year's worth of solar data at this point that allows us to start digging into it and learning about both the instrument and the sun. Okay, uh, so, so the goals for the uh, new solar telescope, which has been a, a collaboration of funded, the construction was funded by the Heising Simons Foundation, the operations are supported by Noir Lab and NASA, um, is to be able to validate strategies for mitigating stellar variability. And in particular, uh, we want to be able to look at models that we're developing for granulation as well as oscillations activity and try to inform the choice of Gaussian process kernels that are going to be applied to that data so as they're appropriate uh, for the star. There's some other possibilities thanks to NUID's unique characteristics. Um, because it's broad wavelength grasp, we have the opportunity to, to compare uh, whether the, the broad wavelength grasp is useful for forming activity indicators and potentially affect the design of future instruments. Um, also has the potential to affect the design of future instruments or RV surveys through things like the choice of the observing cadence uh, implications for the number of targets. Um, and one of the ways that comes up is uh, we, we chose to take a lot of data. So every 55 seconds are exposure times. A little bit annoying in terms of processing, but it does allow us to really study the oscillations and granulation and understand how things like integration times will affect our, our surveys. And then finally, uh, it, it's great. There are other stellar telescopes, HARPS, HARPS uh, North, Express, um, and we'll be able to compare with those to understand which of the things we're seeing are, are really stellar because they show up in all the instruments and which ones could be some form of instrumental variability that uh, we need to, to better understand. You're muted again, Eric. <laughs> every, time, every time you change slides, it mutes you. Okay. Uh, so the first thing I'll mention is a, a kind of a technical note, but it's particularly important because I want to encourage people to to look at the new solar data. If you go to the archive and download forty thousand spectra, um, you'll you'll have some absolutely terrible RVs because you're looking at a cloud or a dome or something. Um, so the archive is archiving everything, um, and so it's important that we apply some cuts primarily based on weather, uh, but also a few other issues having to do with uh, when the the instruments properly calibrated and when the pipeline uh, is able to, to behave very well. Um, so we do impose several cuts. The, critically, those cuts are based only on things other than the RV. So things like uh, the, the time of day, the air mass, uh, the we have a, a periodometer that measures the brightness of the sun in an integrated band uh, that's separate from the fiber, and we can compare those two as well as look at the RMS on a second by second basis. That forms a really great weather indicator, and that gets like 95% of the uh, observations that we reject just based on that comparison alone. 
And once we do that, then we also are selecting precise and robust orders. Um, so, so here I've plotted uh, the physical orders for the new coverage. And the, the zeros, of course, aren't, aren't really zero. They're orders where we don't have lines in the, uh, the, the mass, the expressive mass to, to compute. Uh, the, the RVs. We're now building other masks uh, in order to compute RVs in, in basically all the orders that aren't terribly affected by telurics. Um, but for this, I, I want to separate kind of what was uh, new and what was old. So I've just looked at the Espresso mask, but then I've uh, downweighted or uh, rejected orders where there's still some issues. Uh, where, for example, we can see clear annual trend due to telurics. So this is based on 36 orders uh, in blue that have been selected here, and uh, then we measure RVs from those. Next step, uh, again, I mentioned we have 55 second exposure times. So I'm bidding five consecutive exposures so as to bend down the P modes uh, for uh, much of the analysis until the very end. Combine those, subtract out uh, a mean daily trend that we're still working to understand, uh, and that's going to be what, what we You're muted again. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, it just takes my mouse a while to find the silly mute button. Um, so, so the first thing I'll mention, uh, and hopefully I'll have time to come back to, is that the Nuid's order RVs are already quite precise. So if you look at the, the five-minute bend ones, you're getting uh, inter within a day, the RMS uh, is you know, 60, 70 centimeters per second from a single order. And so what that means is we have a lot of power to combine uh, orders or uh, use more restrictive line lists to, to see if we can mitigate that cell activity being very uh, careful in what we include. And so that's something that we're working on, particularly with Alex Wise. Uh, we posted a paper uh, recent from him and Petr Plavsha in the, the Slack as well to discussing some of those choices. Um, so, so to the GP aspect of the talk, um, we've recently been trying to develop Gaussian processes that are physically motivated. So, of course, we've seen lots of applications of the quasi-periodic kernel. Uh, I mean, that that's a great kernel if you're looking at stars that have active regions that persist for more than one rotation time because they come back around and the, the periodic part makes sense. Um, but if you look at a, a lot of the quieter stars, you may be looking at stars that don't have such strong active regions. There's a correlation, so smaller active regions don't last as long. And so uh, we may need to use kernels that are focused more on a, a local smoothing without that quasi-periodic aspect. And indeed, uh, Christian Gilbertson can, did some SOAP simulations, putting in realistic uh, size and lifetime activity correlation, and fit a, a kernel to those active regions in SOAP data. And then we've taken that kernel and applied it to the daily averages of the NUID observations. So, so here are the, the days where you have at least, I forget whether there's an hour or two of data uh, within that day. And you can see that most of it looks pretty good. There's a, a few uh, outliers there that we're still trying to understand. Are those uh, real or is there something we still have to, to figure out? And indeed, we're looking forward to the uh, solar data comparison that Lily Zhao is or organizing. Um, but, but if we look at this, we can go ahead and fit that kernel for active regions, and we can say all we're going to do is allow its amplitude to change. So we're going to assume the time scale uh, and the shape are right. And if we do that, the, the best fit amplitude comes at 20% higher than uh, what came out of the Gilbertson all uh, modeling the SOAP data. If, on the other hand, you say, well, well let's let the time scale fit. That, that kernel has a time scale parameter. It's based on a matern kernel, um, although it's not just a matern kernel. Um, that time scale does get longer, out to eight and a quarter days, or eight point four days. Um, and as Annalise will probably point out, yeah, that's kind of what you expect if there's something kind of rotation-ish, um, but, but not lasting you know, long enough to come back around. Um, so, so maybe the, the largest signals we're seeing here may have an, a rotation component, particularly some of the more recent data um, since, since November, where activity started picking up again. But we have this very high cadence uh, time sampling. We want to take advantage of that. And so uh, Zhao uh, Guo and Jacob Loon have been working to develop uh, GP kernels informed by observations both of the sun, but also other stars in an seismology context. So, so Zhao combined both theoretical and empirical relations to get these power spectral density representations of oscillations and granulation. And then uh, they worked together and Jacob was able to come up with Gaussian process representations to, to those uh, kernels. And so if we want to represent oscillations, uh, that's actually been done previously in a paper with uh, Eric Pettigura and Dan Foran Mackey on having an approximation based on a stochastically driven damped harmonic oscillator. 
Um, and then Jacob's contribution here was to, to work through integrating for finite exposure times. And we're taking into account the, the kind of weird cadence. We have a 55 seconds on, 38 seconds off, 55 seconds on, 38 seconds off. And we can uh, fit for that kernel to see the oscillations effect. We can do the same thing with granulation. Uh, in this case, that the kernel's a little bit different, but uh, you know, still familiar looking in, in many ways. Uh, we, we adopted a two component granulation model for this because that's what we were able to calibrate with the astro seismology uh, that, that Jao was looking at uh, to, to based on sort of that data. It's possible there's a third or fourth granulation component uh, for on longer time scales, and we'll uh, maybe get to that a little bit later. Okay, so back to data. Uh, if we take the new solar data, and instead of bidding at five minutes to look at things like the daily uh, averages, uh, if we first bin for, for one observation, then for two observations, three, four, and we look at how the RMS of the binned data within one day decreases with the number of observations, you can see uh, how that decreases, how it improves, and how that compares to a naive one over root n scale and you'd expect from photon noise. So one, of course, uh, is the anchor point here. If you look at consecutive observations, that the anti-correlation of rapidly sampled points within an oscillation time scale means your RMS is dra dropping faster than photon noise. Once you hit uh, five, six minutes, um, now it, it starts to level off and you can see that the de improvement in precision as you've been further is much slower than what you'd get from photon noise alone. So this has important implications for the design of RV surveys, and we want to have an accurate representation of that so that we plan them accordingly, and we want to have an accurate GP kernel that's able to uh, include the information that we do take when we have multiple observations in one night appropriately. So uh, let's take that baseline model where we plug in uh, the active regions, granulations, oscillations, take into account the finite exposure times, wrap that all up in one GP, and plot what sh we should have seen. So there's zero free parameters, nothing is matched here, and okay, I'd say it's pretty good. Um, but of course, uh, we always will aim for a lot better. Uh, the key thing to note here is that uh, the, it, the effects of granulation, the, the longer time scales, uh, within a night aren't uh, a a a estimated accurately um, in the sense that there's a higher RMS than you'd expect from our, our baseline model with, with no tweaks. And so you see that mostly once you start to hit 30 minutes or more. Um, and so one obvious solution is, remember I said, we put in two granulation components. There's evidence for third and fourth granulation components. So I just took that same functional form and said, what if I add a third granulation component with a, a time scale of several hours um, and then tweak the uh, model a little bit? And so you can see that uh, the green curve shows if all I do is add that third granulation component. Um, since I had a third granulation component, it, it means I have to adjust the, the strength of the first two because otherwise you know, I fit to a two component model to a three component thing. So, so, so I am tuning the strength of the, the other ones, but only the granulation is tuned in the, the green curve. Um, now you can see a, a really nice fit to the data uh, that describes the, the correlations on almost all the time scales. If you look carefully, you'll see that there's a, a, a little under prediction for uh, the, the very shortest time scales. And so I can uh, adjust for that by increasing the strength of oscillations. Um, and so I still want to get the bottom of why that is. Um, but it, it gives us a, a very nice model for, uh, for, for the observed temporal behavior of the new solar spectrum. Okay, so uh, summary of what we've done so far. Uh, NUID is giving high cadence, high precision, some of the sun as a star observations. Uh, Andrea Lynn has a nice paper summarizing the current state of that. Um, there's a GP model now that accounts for the temporal variability to short-lived active regions, and that gives a much better fit to new solar observations than trying the quasi-periodic kernel. Um, we pro also provide GP models for temporal variability to oscillations and granulations, including finite integration times, and we're uh, in the process of validating and calibrating those GP models uh, based on new solar data. Uh, I think it's still preliminary, so it's, at the moment I'll say it's suggestive that a three-component granulation model uh, may be more appropriate for the sun, um, and hopefully in the coming months uh, we'll turn that into something more concrete, quantitative. Okay, so, so of course uh, there's always more work to be done. Thinking of some of the open questions, uh, we're iterating with the NUID team to try to characterize and improve the, the instrument and pipeline. Uh, so asking questions like, do we see the, the strength for oscillations and granulation to be persistent and robust? 
um, that would suggest to me that it's uh, stellar. Whereas if we saw that we're, you know, there's extra oscillations in January, but not in March, that would look to me like we need to figure out what's going on in the instrument. So we're trying to iterate with them and the software team as we uh, gradually improve things. There's still some room for improvement, but I think uh, it's already doing quite well. Uh, another uh, interesting challenge is, is whether we'll be able to find ways to separate the variability due to active regions from supergranulation. So you may remember that uh, you know, both supergranulation and active regions can contribute to the, the signal uh, of stellar variability on time scales of you know, kind of a day-ish uh, or so. And so if two mechanisms are causing variability on the same time scale, that could be very difficult if we have, say, a strategy to mitigate one or the other, unless we're able to pull out other features of the spectrum that allow us to distinguish when or how much of the perturbation at a given time is due to active regions versus supergranulation. And so we're doing things like looking at measuring the strength of os oscillations and granulation using curated line lists to be able to try to uh, pull out those effects. Uh, and, and another uh, active project is to measure several different stellar variability indicators from the Newid solar data and then compare how well uh, that they do in identifying that activity, both classical and data driven, and then coupling that to the multivariate GP analysis of RVs and stellar indicators uh, via the, the multivariable linear regression, or, uh, multivariable Gaussian process uh, model that uh, Christian's worked on. Uh, it's sort of a, a generalization of the Raj Paul that allows paper that allows you to use multiple indicators and, and multiple derivatives, sort of an arbitrary way with arbitrary kernels. And so that will allow us to tie these physically inspired kernels to uh, whatever indicators we pick out, whether they be classical or data driven. Okay, so I want to return to one other point, uh, sort of motivated by some of the discussions earlier in, in our meeting. Uh, so I, I mentioned earlier that new order RVs were already quite precise. Uh, and you kind of see this by either comparing the, the medium RMS within a day to the photon noise. You can see they're you know, very close to each other, so there's not a whole lot of uh, extra variance there, and also just the absolute value. Uh, of course, the, the daily means uh, have extra variability to the activity from day to day. And so if we wanted to try to be able to, to figure out what's causing that daily variability, what are some of the other things we could look at to distinguish that? Uh, and so, so one, uh, idea that I, I tried based on the earlier discussions was what if instead of computing uh, the spectrum from the entire or the RVs from the entire spectrum at once, what if we divided the spectrum into several uh, chunks? Here I picked four different uh, sets of orders just from literally from the 25 percent of the information from the blue to 25 percent a little bit redder, you know, uh, divide the in four sets, not equal number of orders, but rather equal information content in some definition that uh, is probably too technical for the talk. Um, and then look at how that compares as we bin it up. And so the first thing you may notice is that on the very shortest time scales, the, the different methods are uh, comparing, uh, have different levels of RV scatter, meaning that the ability to uh, bin your data is different whether we're using those bluer orders or red orders. It, on short time scales, it improves with time uh, differently. Uh, but on longer time scales, once you kind of get to you know 15, 20 minutes or so, you see that uh, they're performing very similar in terms of their uh, performance. So uh, this is the type of observation that we hope to do. This uses, again, only those 36 orders that we picked out from the Expresso mass. So we've really not exploited the full leverage of the, the NUID uh, instrument. There's several orders, the near IR, that are, are quite usable. Probably not quite as high precision, but still uh, a lot of information there. So we'll be looking at using those to try to come up with chromatic um, or, or line depth or temperature type probes of the different mechanisms. And with that, I'll turn it open to questions. Uh, thanks a lot, Eric. Uh, just perhaps a, a small question. So you said that you were using the Expresso mask, and uh, you only have, are using 36 orders. But in Expresso, like in those masks, you have like 70 or 80 orders. So is it because you are rejecting a lot of the blue because you don't have the LFC there, and then you don't explode the red part because we don't have the red part in Expresso? Or can you just give more details on this, please? Um, yeah, so, so uh, let's see. Uh, the, the reddest part, as you mentioned, Expresso just doesn't have lines. 
Um, some of the orders in the red works, which it does have lines, are significant to large contamination. Uh, in the sense, if I, I look at the year time scale, I can see there's an annual trend in that order. Um, and so we'll probably be uh, experimenting with kind of trimming the espresso mass to try to dilute the effect of those uh, lines that are affected by telluric. Um, so we're actually, the laser cone we take at the beginning of the night, at the end of the night, there might be sometimes in the middle as well, but then they, uh, so the night to night is calibrated a laser cone. Within the night, they're using the Fabry Pro Etalon uh, at every exposure time, sort of track it within the night. That was, that procedure is designed for nighttime observations. <laughs> uh, and so we're, we're taking that same method applied to solar observations. Uh, where the the variations within the day are much stronger than they are at night because of the they refill the dewer first thing in the morning, so it'll be stable at night. Unfortunately for us, that means it's uh, least linear during the daytime. So we're using the Edelon to calibrate it, uh, you know, rather than the the Fabry Pro. So we do have information to calibrate uh, all the way into the blue. Um, but I guess uh, the, the there's something in the extraction. That, that caused us to, to trim where where we're using the, the blue lines. But you can also see that, and the flux goes, we have very little flux in the you know far blue, right? And so you can see the the RMS of the reddest, or the, the bluest orders here on the right is already shooting at pretty high. And so I think you're right, we, we will eventually be able to recover information from another, you know, six orders or something, uh, but just that the information content won't be very high because the photon noise from fiber loss. Good, yes, thank you. Yes. More questions? Yeah, Heather. For your thanks, Eric, for a uh, really interesting talk. For your GP models for your granulation, can you tell us about what the hyperparameters are and what you think that they're tracing physically and what they can tell us about the, the granulation? Um Probably, if I sat down and thought about it, uh, so so if, if you look, I mean, the easy one where they are, the, the capital S's here, those are strength terms. That's just the strength of correlation. That's the easy one. Um, omega one here, that's the the term that's multiplying. Delta is the difference in time or absolute value, the difference in time, at least for instantaneous. Yeah, this this version is the instantaneous one rather than the integrated one. Uh, so so here, this is giving you the sort of time scale for uh, the the oscillatory part um, and, and the exponential part, I guess, is, as well here, it shows up in, in both places. Um, and there's another parameter that shows up having to do with the, the integration time. So uh, I, I think of it as basically an amplitude and a time scale for each component. And they have these kind of sh you know, shapes, uh, you probably remember from looking at uh, power spectrum of the, the the granulation points where it's kind of like a shelf and a fall off, right? And so if I if I have a, a function that doesn't look like that, I can kind of approximate it by having the the shelf two of them at different places, and I can kind of like stitch two. Okay, I have a more complex shape. I can put a third. Um, and so so they, they have been used to to sort of fit the power spectrum density of many stars, not just the sun. Um, the thing that worries me is, is what my statistician friends call the fallacy of Greek letters, I meaning just because you give something a, a Greek letter doesn't mean it, it really corresponds to, to what you want it to correspond to. So, for example, if I fit a two component granulation model and then compare the parameter values to the three component granulation model, well, uh, you know, the, the, the parameters don't match. And that doesn't mean the model's like not good. It just means that in those two models are different. I have used the same Greek letter for the for different things. So, so that to me cautions that you know when you're trying to interpret too much physically. Clearly, there's a strength. Clearly, there's a time scale. But I, I'm not sure how far you want to take that. I see uh, Sharon had a question in the Slack about the power spectrum of solar RVs with the best fit GP components. I don't think I understand the question, so so maybe oh, maybe the reply will clarify it. Um, I, I think I'm going to have to ask you to clarify the question for your answer. And the, the way the, the GP kernels were derived was by first computing the power spectrum uh, of of not just the sun but lots of other astro seismic targets, and then fitting models to the to the power spectrum for those other cases, and then finding the GP uh, covariance kernel that would have the same. Uh, sort of behavior as that power spectrum density. So, so they, they should be a, a pretty close match uh, there. I mean, there's some issues like the, the oscillations have been approximated with a, a Gaussian envelope rather than a, a sum of discrete mode. So it's you know, not exact, exact, but uh, the hope there is it's a, a good approximation based on the power spectrum density being the same. 
Okay, I was just curious about the relative um, power in granulation vs. Um, oscillation. Oh, the relative power. Well, I mean, it's, it's they're on different time scales, right? So, I mean, you, you can see that the uh, the the oscillations make a really big effect for you know your first five minutes, but but once you're out at you know 15 minutes, the oscillations are are kind of irrelevant, and and granulation is everything, right? So, so I don't think it's so much like which is stronger. I think it's more about what time scale, you know, for your given target, its brightness, um, the size of your telescope, the efficiency of your instrument. Um, you know, those things are going to affect how much you're going to be uh, worrying about one or the other. I mean, I, I kind of view oscillations as uh, important for the sun and some very bright stars, maybe some of the ones targeted for future direct imaging missions. But uh, granulation is the thing I'm worried about as, as a potential, you know, real barrier because some of these strategies like, oh, let's come back and observe the same star, you know, either three times in a row or three times over the course of a night. Um, as we can see here, at least the time scales that uh, for the sun and, and new is observing to so five hours within a day, we're seeing that you know you're, you're not getting anywhere close to the the sort of one over root n that you were hoped for that, uh, and so that that's where I think it's going to affect these observing plans. And I was sort of uh, I, also looking at, at uh, Lev's question about if I could give a simple recipe for bidding. Um, so I'm not sure whether I think you're suggesting what should the observers do and, and I won't say it's simple because it depends on the star, your in, your telescope. And so that's why we want to give you these kernels so you can do the simulation for your telescope and your target and figure out what's the optimal uh, exposure time for uh, both oscillations and granulations for that target. Yes, Susan. Um, so very nice talk, thank you. I was wondering, um, thinking back to what Belinda talked about yesterday, how unique the, the, the fits you perform are um, in the sense that if you were to generate, so how much degeneracy there is in the parameters that you fit essentially. And then the other question is probably one that you can't answer yet, but is uh, if you look at the sun um, uh, at different times, would you get the same uh, granulation power spectrum and then the same, same GP? Okay. I mean, it'd be nice to redo this when it's more active, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So, so in some ways, uh, it's kind of sad to see the sun getting more active if, if you've been, you know, evaluating how well you're doing based on the RMS, and suddenly it's hopeless because the sun's being active. But in other ways, it's really good because it allows us to start testing whether our methods that uh, we can see if they work well during the quiet phase, how well they work during the active phase. So uh, the first question, how degenerate is it? That the oscillations separate very cleanly because you know they're on such a different time scale. The active region, there's a very small covariance once you add the, the longer granulation component terms. So the, the first two terms are, are like, I think maybe 30-ish minutes. So they're not that long time scales uh, for the sun. Uh, if you start thinking about super granulation, you can start having you know, time scales of several hours or even uh, a day or something. At th that point, it can be a little bit covariate with the activity cycle, but uh, for the sun and, and this particular data set, those th that correlation was negligible. The annoying thing, you know, when I was uh, fitting these, is that there is a strong correlation between the strength and the time scale of those first few granulation components. And so, if you let everything be totally free, it's it's terribly degenerate. If you bring in the the sort of theory of, of astroseismology and say, well, actually, we have experience looking at other stars in photometry, and we know about the relationships of their time scales, and you try to bake that in, uh, that certainly helps you, you split things off. That's why I was primarily tuning the amplitudes rather than trying to adjust uh, the, the time scales. Um, and so, so I think uh, there is a degeneracy if you let all the parameters vary at once. It's quite strong. If you bring in some physics, you can help reduce that. Um, at least for, for my purposes of kind of designing a survey and being able to separate out granulation noise from active region noise, I'm not sure I care so much about the, you know, whether I've put more of the power in the second or third component of the granulation as long as I'm matching the temporal behavior will. So I'm not sure that's a, a, a practical problem for people who only care at the RV and not studying stars themselves. Um, absolutely, we want to, to look to longer time scales and compare things like, is the strength of the granulation robust in time? Does it correlate with activity? Um, yeah, so that's definitely something we'll be doing over uh, the course of hopefully the next year as the sun picks up. Just to come back on that, my question was also asked from a practical perspective. Um, for example, if you, you know, asking if you design a survey, do you try and take each star in your survey and monitor it continuously for one night to calibrate that noise? 
that short-term noise. Uh, and can you then how often do you have to do that again for each star in your survey to be sure that it hasn't changed? But yeah, I, I like that point a lot. I think uh, if we saw that for the sun, I could have picked, you know, any one day over two years and, and I'd get a strategy that was basically the same, then I think that would be a, a great plan for, for future RV surveys. If we see that, you know, it's changing by a, a significant, you know, the, the it's quality of change in the observing strategy, depending on whether I look at it uh, during active or quiet phase, then maybe you have to update that. And every you know year or two, take another intense observation to start to ask, are we in an active phase? Or maybe you can recognize that through classical activity indicators. And, and you can kind of recognize when it's time, oh, the star is becoming more active. We should you know recalibrate our granulation met, uh, by beating on that star for you know a half a night or something. Uh, so time's up. Uh, maybe you can keep your discussion on the Slack. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so let's thanks Eric again.